Hello, and welcome to our summary of Chapter 3, The First Scientist. This chapter is mostly about Galileo, but starts off with a few pages on William Gilbert. As the author describes, William Gilbert is from England, and he studied magnets and magnetism to much acclaim and became quite famous in his day. But Gribben calls him one of the two first scientists, Galileo being the other, because of the way he worked. And that can be seen in his famous book called De Magnet. Remember, all books were written in Latin at the time. If they were about science or natural philosophy, it was as it was called back then. You can see from some of the diagrams from his book uh, that he was very careful about making observations. He was all about the process of science. He was all about coming up with a hypothesis, testing it, seeing it w whether it was true or false, and reworking experiments. But the bulk of this chapter lies with the extraordinary life of Galileo. Galileo was just an amazing scientist, and Gribben really, later in the book, really gives him the credit for being the first true scientist that we profile. One of the things that I'd like you to keep in mind are the four cities which play a central role in Galileo's life. And we're going to talk briefly about these now, but I just want you to take a look at this old map of Italy. This is a cross-section of Italy. You can see Rome down in the south, which is the state of the church. And in the north, you have Padua, which is one of the towns, one of the cities in the Republic of Venice. Now, Venice was a very free-thinking, open area. And Rome, which was, the, which, which was a little more conservative, and they weren't interested as much in the new ideas that Galileo would discover. Um, Galileo also started his education at Pisa, as we'll see in a minute, and uh, his family had ties, um, actually his father being born in Florence, uh, and went back to Florence for a bit of time to raise the family. So we'll talk a little bit about these. Remember, there's lots and lots of details in this chapter, and they're mostly focused on Galileo and his work. It's really fascinating. When Galileo when it was time for Galileo to go to the university, his father, who was a musician and kind of scraped by being a musician, really wanted his son, his oldest son, to uh, go into medicine. You could make a lot more money in medicine than you could being a musician, um, but it didn't quite turn out that way. Galileo dutifully went to the University of Pisa and started studying medicine, but his heart really wasn't in it. And one day, he attended a math lecture by a famous professor and loved math. So he went back and he asked his father, hey, can I change from medicine to math? The father exploded on him, said, no, 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 you can't. Look at the difference in the salaries. I want you to stick with medicine. Well, as you'll read in the chapter, uh, Galileo really does switch over to mathematics, starts studying uh, all sorts of experiments with motion and inertia, and in fact, becomes a professor at the University of Pisa in mathematics. This is an early diagram from one of his books on motion and inertia. So he's at Pisa for a while, but uh, wants to make a little more money and knows that he can, that there's an opening at the University of Padua, which is in the Venetian uh, Republic, and he gets a job there. And uh, the years and the experiments and the time that he had at Padua for a fairly long time, about 15 or 16 years, uh, proved to be some of the happiest in Galileo's life and some of his best work. Part of that work was uh, the diagram on the left here, the fa famous Galileo compass. Uh, some people call it the calculator of the 1600s, and it allowed um, the military to calculate where they should um, angle their cannons. And the inspiration from the compass um, actually came up with a, one of the first clocks that was ever invented, also inspired by Galileo on the right. Um, Galileo also, at that time, started to become interested in astronomy. But his famous observations of uh, the stars and the planets didn't happen yet. Um, he that had to come a little bit later with the uh, invention and then his reinvention of the telescope. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. But first, there are two people in Galileo's life that are very, very important. One is Paolo Sarpi, who was a uh, leader in Venice, in the Republic, in the Venetian Empire. And he was very open, very much a friend of um, new ideas and a friend of Galileo. Um, on the other hand, there was Roberto Bellarmine of Rome. He was a Jesuit cardinal, 
and friendly with Galileo, but also an, uh, a um, leader in the church, and it was a little more conservative on new ideas. The church was very much interested in uh, maintaining the status quo. Uh, as a matter of fact, at one point early on, uh, Paolo Sarpi, um, who was saying that the way to heaven was really paved with good works, not just because you were born a king or a pope, uh, which threatened um, Roman power. He was up in Venice, and there was an attempted murder on his life. You'll read about that in more details. And that had quite an effect on Galileo. Galileo learned that even if you were up north in the University of Padua, you couldn't stay away from um, the power of the church. The really big uh, instrument, the new tool in Galileo's life, which led to uh, all of his incredible discoveries, was the story of a Dutch lens maker by the name of Hans Lippersche. Hans Lippersche actually reinvented the telescope. As you'll remember, we read earlier that Diggs of England uh, actually invented the telescope, but Lippersche reinvented it, and this time Galileo heard rumors that there was this new instrument coming down. And Galileo invents this telescope, and um, we have a couple bullets here about Lippersche. And um, actually what happened was when Lippershey's telescope was discovered, it's a great story how Galileo hears about it, wants to make his own, makes it better than Lippershey's, and immediately tries to set up a um, meeting with the Doge of the Venetian Republic. The Doge, D-O-G-E, is the leader of Venice. It was the reinvention of the telescope and Galileo making, Galileo making it better, which really, really um, helped propel his reputation. By this time, he's a ve very famous scientist for all his experiments, as you'll read. And he starts to look at the sky and writes a small book called Starry Messenger. Here's the cover panel from Starry Messenger, again in Latin, and some of the diagrams. But what Galileo discovers, and a lot of people including the church, thought that everything outside of the earth was perfect. For example, the earth itself, because the human beings were in it, was imperfect, but everything outside, the moon, the sun, the planets, the stars, they were all perfect. Well, Galileo starts looking at the surface of the moon and says, no, it's not perfect. It's not a perfect sphere. It's, uh, it's filled with craters. Uh, he looks at the sun and discovers sunspots. He looks at Jupiter and finds other worlds circ circling Jupiter. And he writes all of this in Starry Messenger. Uh, he does not come out publicly, though, yet to fully support the Copernican model. And he explains initially when Galileo, that's Galileo on the right, explains to Roberto Bellerman uh, about these ideas. Uh, the church accepts them and says, sure, you can write on them. Uh, then Galileo also writes his, probably the uh, most famous book of his, called The Dialogue on the two chief world system. Here's the cover page and a diagram. And Galileo received permission from the church to write this book, but it's a fascinating story to see what happens and why he has to recant that he doesn't believe in the Copernican system. So please make sure that you read carefully this chapter, take good notes. As, it will, as, uh, as you'll see, Galileo comes before the Inquisition and really on a fluke that I would like you to read about, a fluke he has to recant. Uh, this is a famous picture many, many years later. Okay, as you read this chapter, chapter 3, I want you to focus on the role of Galileo's father, Galileo himself, in Italy, of course, the power struggle between Venice and Rome, and the role of Pisa and Padua in his life. Paolo Sarpi, Roberto Bellarmine, we talked about them briefly, and the role that a new invention, the telescope by Hans Lippersche, that Galileo dramatically improved on, was able to see all of the wonderful new discoveries, and uh, then his relationship with the church and what happened. That's a really, really fascinating part of this chapter. Um, also, there's only a couple pages on William, Gil William Gilbert, and uh, I'll only ask perhaps a question about him. Remember, a couple course reminders. The midterm for is from chapters uh, 1 to 8 of our text, and the midterm will also have questions from PBS's Galileo Battle for the Heavens. So please make sure you read that, and please start to post to our Google Plus community called the History of Science.
Okay, that's it for chapter three, a fascinating chapter about the role of Galileo in the history of science. And remember, Gribben calls these two scientists, Galileo and William Gilbert, the first two true scientists.